Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes um, to respect everybody's time. You know, you have this hour to share with us and we really appreciate it. Uh, in the meantime, while we wait for a few more folks to join, I want to invite you to just confirm that your name that's showing up on Zoom is your actual name. I'll put some instructions up about how to do that. And those instructions are in the chat as well. So come on in, just a little Zoom housekeeping. Um, to confirm that your display name is showing your true name, you'll want to find your bottom controls um, and select participants. So the place where it shows everybody who's on this call. Um, you'll click that and then you can see, whoop, you can see your own name. And if you hover over, there's three little dots. And so if you click those three dots, you can rename yourself. If you'd like captions on the call today, you can turn them on. They're ready to go for you. Um, again, that will be in your bottom controls. You'll select those three little dots in the bottom, press more and captions and show captions. The last thing I'll ask you to do is go ahead and find the chat. Um, and so those are, again, in your bottom controls, there's a little icon that says chat. So if you can click that, it should pop up a chat. Um, and it would be good to see that because we have great presenters today and we'll link their organizations for you to the chat so that if you want to read more or find out more, you'll, you'll be able to do so. As we go today, we'll take your questions in the chat as well. So if someone says something and it's really sparking a burning question for you or a connection, go ahead and type it into the chat and we'll collect all of that for our final portion of Q&A. Okay, but with that, I think we can begin. So welcome everybody to our first ever uh, webinar meeting of Arts Learning Lab. My name is Laura Rogar. Um, I'm a white woman in my late 30s. I have brown hair and today I'm wearing a white shirt and a little gold necklace. Um, I'm the Arts Learning Services Director for Arts Idaho. And what uh, Arts Idaho is, also known as Idaho Commission on the Arts, we're a state agency under the office of the governor. Um, today we're meeting as our, again, first ever convening for Arts Learning Lab, which is a webinar series. And our intent is to collect people that work in the arts um, to share knowledge, uh, inspiration, and understanding. So I hope you can enjoy today. And uh, hopefully you can hear something that you can take with you and apply to your own work. My uh, intended meeting outcomes, I'm an educator, right? So we always got to talk about our why. Why are we here together doing this? Um, we're having a conversation and we're answering a question, you know, a million different ways. What does it look like to center people with disabilities in arts learning, right? If we put people with all disabilities, seen and unseen, at the very center of our work, what would we discover, right? What would we experience? So first today, I hope you can just learn from three nonprofit leaders who are already doing this, who are already centering people with disabilities in their creative practice. Um, and then secondly, I'd love for you to start considering some steps you might take to increase access in your work. Um, they could be big or small, and you might have questions about how to do that. So our presenters today would be really good folks to ask. Presenting today, we've got three organizations. Um, the first is Art Spark Texas, and their executive director, Celia Hughes, will share followed by Idaho Parents Unlimited. You'll hear from Heather Kirk and Sarah Gornick. Um, and lastly, you'll hear from Open Arms Dance Project with Megan Brandel and Heather Marie. Again, please save those uh, questions for the chat. You can put them in the chat and then 
at the very end of our time together, we'll have some space for Q&A. Uh, so without further instruction or preamble, I'm really excited to welcome Celia Hughes from ArtSpark, Texas. Hello, everyone. It's really, I'm really happy to be here and honored that you, that Laura asked me to uh, join her here. We had a very serendipitous uh, meeting a year ago uh, in the lobby of a hotel in Raleigh, North, North Carolina, uh, when we were both trying to get to the airport at a really, really early hour and uh, shared shared a cab. So, uh, you know, sometimes beautiful things happen from serendipitous meetings. So uh, thank you, Laura, for this opportunity. I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen here and tell you a little bit about ArtSpark Texas um, some of you may uh, have heard of the organization Very Special Arts, VSA. Um, that's who we were for many, many years. We were VSA Texas. Um, and we changed our name three years ago to Art Spark Texas uh, with the mission of sparking the creative in everyone. Uh, this picture to me represents a lot of who we are and who we serve. Uh, these are uh, young adults who have gone through our speaker training program, and they were actually uh, there four um, individuals, and then my program coordinator is Miss Boy in the middle, uh, and they were doing running a series of workshops for high school students who were transitioning out of school. Uh, high school students with disabilities to show them and help them to understand that there is life after high school and that they have an op they have choices and uh, opportunities within their community for them to explore and continue to develop into the adults that they want to be. So um, ArtSpark has many different programs. I'm going to turn my timer on. I meant to turn that on earlier. Um, we have many different programs um, and our mission statement is to challenge perceptions of how people contribute and that's contribute to society, contribute to their lives, contribute to their families uh, by creating an arts-inspired inclusive community of individuals with and without disabilities. And through our programs, we try to, get, to uh, create communities of dancers, of communities of actors, of painters, uh, writers, uh, performers, uh, artists. Like I said, we have a number of different uh, uh, ways that we bring people together uh, through our inclusive programming uh, and introduce the community to our people and introduce the people that we work to the community. Here we have a young woman who has created a doll through one of our summer arts programs. The woman in the middle is she's a 65 year old woman who with a developmental disability who has lived in group homes her whole life. And this was at our Speaking Advocates program where we helped her to tell her story, to craft her story into a, a very moving and uh, powerful speech that then we traveled around to conferences and she told her story. And on the, on the right side of the screen, we have several individuals uh, at an art opening, one of the individuals in a wheelchair, another individual with a physical uh, disability. And so again, uh, bringing people together through the arts uh, to, um, to build community. Um, everything we do is dedicated to a creative outlook on learning, lifelong learning. We have an adult uh, program called Mobile Art where we take art into residential facilities, into senior activity centers, into assistive living places. Uh, we take art to older adults who may not uh, 
be able to leave their home for one reason or another, or it's difficult to leave their home. Uh, we work with caregivers and uh, bring art to the people. Um, and during COVID, we were actually able to take make this program uh, into a phone program, which when I talked with my teaching artists and I said, we're now going to be teaching art over the phone. They looked at me like I, you know, had grown, you know, I had, they didn't quite know what I was talking about, nor did I, but we were like, okay, we're going to have to do this. And actually we were able to do it, uh, surprisingly well. Um, we wrote lesson plans ahead of time. We mailed supplies. We de delivered supplies. We put supplies into little packages and left them on our porch. Um, and then and in each with the supplies, there was a lesson plan that was very, very well thought out and, and with uh, photos and simple directions to follow. We put uh, directions up on our YouTube channel so people could go onto YouTube and look at the lessons and figure that out. And then through the phone, we had um, conference calls. And so through an Uber conference call program, we were able to bring everybody together on the phone. And it was really quite uh, quite marvelous to bring people together who are in isolation in their homes to talk to each other on the phone. Friendships were made over the phone as they talked about their art and they talked about what they did and what they were feeling that day. And uh, we're actually, uh, now that uh, COVID is uh, hopefully behind us, we're actually continuing that program because when you work with older adults and you work with people with disabilities, just because we're no longer in lockdown, that doesn't mean people it's any easier for people to get to places. Transportation is still such an issue for many people. Uh, leaving the home sometimes is really difficult for people with uh, severe uh, physical disabilities or people who can't drive. So we're maintaining a fairly strong uh, virtual presence um, as we move forward. Uh, in these three pictures on the left, we have three uh, women from our mobile art program in the center. We have a teaching artist talking with one of our young, uh, young participants at a summer camp. And on the right, we have an older woman who is uh, holding up a little crown that she made for Mardi Gras uh, with a big smile on her face. Um, education is, uh, uh, is like I said, uh, the core of what we do, even though it looks very, very different in every program. But in this particular program, this is our high school program where we're working with, see, uh, with adults uh, that are transitioning. These are youth ages 18 to 21. And this project was a flutter book project. So for, for uh, the whole semester, they created a book. First, they made the book. Then we read poems each uh, class period when they were working on their book. We read a poem. We talked about the poem. We meditated and practiced our breathing. Uh, and then we had an art project around that particular poem. And so by the end of the semester, these students had an entire book of uh, of writings and uh, artwork that they had created that were based on poems and prompts that we had worked on through the semester. Um, last year, we served 150 students at the Rosedale School. The Rosedale School in Austin is a uh, is the campus where students who are, who are um, medically fragile, multiply disabled, who uh, can't really thrive on a regular campus, uh, they go to this campus and they have traditionally not received very much, if any, art programming. So we've been uh, we've been doing a dance program in there now for eight years, and we also do some of our. Um, some of our visual art and speaking programs in there and also our go project. So we served 150 students this year through our programming. And then we also uh, work with an organization here in town called mind pop. 
where we do professional development and we trained a hundred special educators how to make their classrooms more engaging for all learners. And in the center, we have a robot that was made by uh, one of our participants uh, out, of, uh, out of recycled objects. Um, so all of our program is inclusive. Um, so we provide opportunities for artists in all disciplines. This is one of our artists, Brian Dodd. He's a young man with autism. And he's at one of our art fairs uh, displaying his work. He, actually, he and his mother actually run a business um, and selling his artwork. And he's, we have worked with Brian now for about 10 years. Uh, and we do art fairs every year. We try to do fairs where we support our artists uh, around the state. Um, we have an inclusive dance program. Again, I've talked to you about mobile arts, uh, speaking advocates. I've talked a little bit about that. Uh, new media arts is where we, uh, this girl is actually in a record, in a radio studio, learning how to, uh, getting her license to be a community radio operator. Um, these are students at one of our school based classroom residencies. Uh, so we do uh, programs at our new office. We have a we now have a radio show on co-op radio. We have a podcast called True Tales by Disability Advocates, which is by and for people with disabilities. And we also op uh, run a monthly open mic, which is online. You're all invited called The Lion and Pirate. And it's uh, the first weekend of the month. And that also is people uh, with and without disabilities. Um, there is a little bit more of some of our participants from True Tales, Lion and Pirate. And um, this is just sort of an example of who we of who we are and who we serve. We serve veterans, uh, like I said, older adults and uh, all kinds of people with and without disabilities. So. I'm uh, available for any uh, conversations or any questions, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of flavor of what we are doing here in, uh, in Austin and across Texas through the work of ArtSpark Texas. And that's my 10 minutes. Thank you so much, Celia. I'm kind of in awe of the breadth and depth of your programming, you know, from life programming from lifelong learners with such good access points, even to programming over the phone, um, all the way to school-based programming, you know, for K-12. It's kind of amazing. Maybe we can all do rounds of applause. Um, I would love to encourage you, if you had a question for Celia come up, uh, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll circle back to it at the end of our time today. Um, but again, thanks so much, Celia and Art Spark. It's just such a pleasure to have you. Yeah. Um, up next, we'll hear from Idaho Parents Unlimited. Um, we'll hear from Heather Kirk and Sarah Gornick. Um, and this organization is also called IPUL for short. So Idaho Parents Unlimited fulfills a mission to educate, empower, support, and advocate for individuals with disabilities and their families. And I think the arts are a big part of that mission work. So. Heather and Sarah, thanks for being here. I'll, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. We're gonna start with our um, presentation. So here we go. Hi everybody, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Heather Kirk, I'm the Statewide Arts Education Coordinator at Idaho Parents Unlimited. We have two programs, our Artists in Residence, which focuses on serving students ages uh, 3 to 21 in schools, community centers, and detention centers, and our Work of Art program, which focuses on serving students 14 to 21 with employment skill building uh, classes and sessions. And I'm here with my colleague, Sarah Gornick, and she is our program coordinator. Um, 
and she's also a performing artist. <laughs> and both of us are parents of children with disabilities, as is everybody at Eiffel. Yep. So we're super excited to be here, and thank you for having us. We're happy to um, and excited to talk about how um, we make our art inclusive and um, what that looks like as a coordinator position and as, from the parent lens. So um, here we go. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I want to just start by saying, um, you know, that as artists, you're a natural because artists are uh, curious by nature. So taking that curiosity and parlaying it into your interactions with people who may have disabilities or differences is the best first step to fostering inclusion. Yep. And another part of that um, process is making mistakes. We're used to making um, mistakes. It's part of, it is part of how we how we create, how we allow our mind to make changes in, in what we do. Um, and so I we all know around here, I make mistakes all of the time. Um, but I but I love to learn how to do things differently from different points of view. And I can only do that when I am creating or when I'm dancing or when I'm singing or any of the other things that I'm doing when I when I mess up or when I think I mess up and, and continue to um, make things look differently from all different perspectives. Right. So being comfortable with making those mistakes, being curious, like the picture says, this is my jam. This is what we do as artists and makers. So the first step really that we discussed when we sat down to make this PowerPoint was getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, I was saying to Sarah, when I first became a parent of a child with a disability, I thought people who worked with disability, people with disabilities were some kind of like special unicorn that they <laughs> had a skill I didn't have. And it really, over time, I came to understand it's just about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable because we sometimes do make those mistakes or we have to show that maybe we don't know what we're doing when we begin to do inclusion. Um, and, and, and we want to look like we know what we're doing and that we're, we're professionals, but sometimes we have to set that aside and really be vulnerable and release our assumptions so that we can find out what people need to be included. Right. I, when I first started teaching um, gymnastics and dance to uh, the little, the little littles and their parents and their parents are right there in the audience staring me in the face. I was always afraid of doing something wrong or looking like I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and it took me a long time to release that fear of being uncomfortable. And then I finally was able to let that let my craft and my and my love of dance and gymnastics and just being being in with the kids take over um and let my creativity show and be one with my three-year-olds and act like a three-year-old and behave in a way that I was able to make connections with the kids and then I would I would see that they would get their skills and they would learn things in a different time frame than I than I was expecting of of them and myself and and it was it was beautiful to grow as a teacher and to grow as um as a learner in making progress with my kiddos and and their parents and creating those relationships and I think that's such a great point Sarah because I think that you know coming into inclusion from a perspective of being in the arts sometimes we get very married to our mm -hmm our lessons and our time frames and really letting go of that and and being present and and setting aside those worries that we won't get through our lessons and that it will take too much time to be inclusive you know that is a process of learning to just set that mindset to the side right Absolutely. i just wanted to touch quickly about some things that we have learned about um administering programmings for inclusion and accessibility. And just a, like a quick list of some questions that you want to think about when you're preparing your space to be inclusive. Um, you know, are wheels going to be able to make it through your space? Walkers, canes, you know, um, are they going to be able to, to see the things you've so beautifully presented, to hear the things you've so beautifully presented? Um, do you have sensory kits for people who may get overwhelmed? And when you're preparing your population, um, preparing yourself for your population, you need to ask questions. Like we take, we do intakes and we ask a lot of questions about what they'll need for their experience. What will they need to engage? What will they need to learn? 
And if there's somebody in your scope of work that can start to take on that role as an accessibility coordinator, that is a great first step in like diving into being an inclusive program. Right. I think sometimes some of that comes from mistakes that we have made or that I have made and assuming that I know what, what you might need. Um, and so then I just do it thinking that that might be exactly what you need, but it might not be what you need. And so asking those questions and really not being afraid to ask those really specific questions during an intake process of what is that going to look like for you? I think you shared a story with me, Heather, at graduation this year, that there were signs all over the stadium mm -hmm. that said there were access, that there were sensory kits, but nobody knew where to find them. So we were prepared, but we we're only halfway prepared. So making sure that when we're creating these spaces that everybody that's involved knows how to access and create create spaces um, for all. That's right. And part of that too is like the letting go of metrics or letting go of optics. And I think sometimes this can be especially challenging for people who have a lot of credentialing and they really have become entrenched in a way of doing things. Um, and when it comes to inclusion, a lot of times you know, releasing those metrics is really important because, you know, that is how we access the creativity that's inside of people. That's how we include them is by not superimposing our metrics upon them. Um, so that's a really important part of giving them agency and getting them to engage in the programming um, and still retaining that sort of flexible scaffolding. I mean, of course, you have to have that, that scaffolding, but then when students do um, generate or express things, you know, we want to just really be sure to validate their experience and validate their effort um, as we move through that. And I think that also comes down to those who are assisting in our programs and, and the things that we are, that we are helping um, our students with. We as the educators understand that and then those who are assisting us also might need to understand that there are processes um, where we where we do need to let our kids create. I think as a parent, I've seen, um, and we talk about this in our office um, a lot too, is that we come, we know our kids are going to these art um, art classes or having these art experiences, yet the art that comes home or the art that we see that has been created certainly is not what our children, what we are expecting our children to come home with. It is, it, it, it looks um, it's like the adult has, uh, right, overly assisted. Thank you for, for those words. Um, and so we want to honor that agency, like Keller said, and, and let that art be what is created. I think I have framed from um, when Truman started um, in occupational therapy at the age of one, um, his uh, finger paint, because that is, that was his art. Right. Um, and and I will, that'll be my most favorite piece of art. Um, and I still have it framed in my home. So um, recognizing and validating that what they create is what they create. Right. Or what anyone, what any of us create. Yeah, matter, exactly. Is what we create. And so, you know, I wanted to pull up this artist. Um, I'm probably not saying her name right, but it's <laughs> Yayoi Kusama. And she's a Japanese artist. And um, you know, as she went along in her career, she it has obsessive compulsive disorder and makes only polka dots or um, small polka dot like marks. And, you know, she was not validated by the artistic community. Um, and, you know, her art now is, as you can see, it's so beautiful. And yet, you know, it's lacking a certain uh, sense of rubric that is not, you know, the composition, the, the, um, the line quality, the shape, the form, all of the scale, all these things that we talk about, you know, she has kind of tossed out the playbook to some degree on a lot of those things. And, and because of that, when we take away those metrics, when we take away that over assisting and all of those things, you can see that she creates something so beautiful and so hypnotic. And we, we're trying to make that space for all of our students to engage the way that they can and, and to see the beauty that's within them and their creativity. So we just want to talk a little bit about building trust, because like Sarah said, we've learned by, you know, making mistakes. We've learned by um, going through the process um, and, you know, building trust with students um, and empowering them to exercise their agency. Um, so sometimes we want to ask. Yeah, we ask, you know, what they what they like to do and understanding that their response may take time and it may come in different forms and being and 
in order to build that trust, we have to honor honor that time and honor their response, um, whether it be what we think it might sh it should or could be or not. We have to honor that um, in any form that they are providing right. the answer. Putting it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And asking for permission for touch. This is something we do like right away with the students um, at Work of Art. Um, we have everybody talk about how they would or would like would not like to be touched. Um, we have a lot of kids yeah. with extreme sensory issues who don't even want to be brushed up against. Um, and so we want to know what their comfort level is. And we want to always ask for permission before we engage in that way. Yep. And, and taking the time to stop and check for understanding too and be like, is that helpful to you the way that I'm touching you or touching your art or moving your wheelchair? Um, and not just assuming be, that we understood what they were saying or that they're comfortable, right? right. So we want to check for that. Absolutely. And say less. This is a <laughs> really important one that it took me a long time to get to, um, which is ironic since we're saying a lot right now, Sarah and I. Um, but working um, with students, really taking the time to stop, like just say what you have to say and then wait. And, and then when you become uncomfortable with the wait time, <laughs> wait a little longer because a lot of these students need um, processing time. And if they get a second, third, fourth direction in a row without stopping to process, that really creates a traffic jam Absolutely. in their brain and they won't remember any of the things that you said. <laughs> So visual aids um, are key for that understanding and also managing that anxiety, both yours that you're trying to get stuff done <laughs> and theirs that they're like, what's happening? They need to know yeah. what's happening next a lot of times. Okay. Um, so letting go of the expectations or outcomes, um, just a couple of highlights that we've been mentioning over and over throughout this. Um, we, we have to resist the urge to take over um, and then making making space and time within within our time frame together um, for those frequent check-ins, um, asking what we need. How can I support you instead of how can I help you? How can I support you? Um, do you need to take a break? It's okay to watch and listen for now and, and right. come in when you're ready. Um, and then in not acknowledging our engagement without judgment, um, whatever that engagement is, we have to let it be. Um, and, you know, lending That's a right. hand or guiding and assisting, um, and, but letting our students and our artists be, be the leaders of, of what it is that they need. Right. That's right. Letting them be the leaders of what they need. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. is something to underscore. We had a student in our work of art program who only wanted to um, draw dinosaurs. And, and that wasn't the curriculum uh, um, <laughs> and he wasn't interested in what we were doing. And we just allowed him to do what he yeah. wanted to do and to be with us and to have the collaborative conversations, but, you know, exactly. allowing them to do what they can do and engage how they can engage. And we had another student who was a super talented artist, but felt overwhelmed in class. So we said, that's fine. You know, just watch and listen. And that's a, mm -hmm. that's what you can do. And, and we're honoring that and moving forward. Right. So I just wanted to point out here that sometimes we, um, well, a lot of times um, we as adults overthink processes and how to help help each other and help our individuals with disabilities, um, sometimes even, even individuals without disabilities. But when, when it comes time to finding ways to assist or lend a hand, um, leaning on our students' peers or each other as peers on how to get the job done. We are overthinkers as adults. We, we live behind the fear of, of um, administration or doing things wrong, but our peers, they just get in and get it done. This is a video of my son speaking to one of his peers, and you will hear from um, Open Arms Dance Project in just a second, um, but just talking, talking to her, her peer as if um, there, you know, he has no disability or, or limitations at all. Exactly. Um, and we we thrive on that example. And so just leaning on our peers to show that to show us as adults um, or or our community leaders how to get things done. Um, yeah, our youth really are yeah. leaders in this in this arena and and their leadership really can help support inclusion. And um 
you know, a lot of times I think when I first started out and my daughter was having peer mentors, I was like, oh, that's so nice of them, those peers to to work with my daughter. (laughs) And then looking back, I can see those peers actually benefited from that interaction more than my daughter with a disability, right? So, you know, it's a beautiful give and take, and that's there as a resource for all of us. Um, So just uh, to touch on, you know, the inclusion of people in the arts, you know, one in five people has a disability of some kind. So when we don't include them in the arts, in the humanities, in all of those cultural touch points, um, you know, we're missing out on a really essential part of our humanity. Absolutely. And history and sharing of history and all of those things um, in whatever art form it is that it comes out of. Um, So, yeah. I think that is pretty self-explanatory it in is. my eyes. Um, what about you? you bet. Yeah. <laughs> we're here for it. Um, and just talking a little bit about art and community. I know we're all really rebuilding our communities after COVID and learning how to come together again. And I think art is really a be- such a beautiful and accessible thing that we can do to come back together and foster that sense of belonging and connection, um, not only for people with disabilities, but all of us, like we were just talking about those peers, yeah. for us as organizations, for us as citizens, um, bringing that art and community together. Yeah, I know that um, my in our, in our situation, um, my son would not be as included in his community if it weren't for the programs that we have here in our organization and the programs that we support um, as an organization and in our in his community um, in all 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 ways of his community um, if it weren't for for the arts um, and maybe I have a little bit of a bias because I am I am a performing artist I am an artist I have children who are artists um, but you know it's it's part of our life and part of who we are as a society right. it's part um, of our heritage yeah. yeah and and lastly you know really that we're better together um, when we're talking about disability centered programming it's really about humans it's about human centered programming and taking the time to focus on that human and to focus on the family that's there with that human, right? And the community that surrounds that person, right? Um, We're all interconnected. We know that. We know that more than ever coming out of COVID. And so just as you're stepping into or or more deeply fostering or relearning about inclusion and accessibility, as I am always relearning, (laughs) um, (laughs) that it's about human-centered programming and family and community. That's all. Thank you so much. Um, We're here for questions. Thank you both so much. So if you have questions (laughs) for Idaho Parents Unlimited, please go ahead and drop them into the chat. Um, We would love to address them. I just really appreciate um, your kind of shining the flashlight on the need to be student-centered and to let students lead, uh, contribute what they want to contribute and what they are able to, and kind of let go of that uh, intense focus on the product. I think all of us arts educators can be really guilty to be like, I I have a plan and it's going to look a certain way. So like, by hook or by crook, I'll force everybody's project to end up looking the same way. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Our final presenters today um, come to us from Open Arms Dance Project. They are Megan Brandel and Heather Marie. Uh, Megan founded Open Arms Dance Project in 2008, and Heather is an Open Arms ambassador who has danced with the project for seven years. Um, So welcome to both of you. Thank you so much, Laura. And oh, I just want to draw all these beautiful connections. Um, so uh, Celia Silva, and I have a hard time with her last name, but she does your dance program. And she um, and I have been in trainings together and she has influenced my work. And then um, Sarah and Heather, both their children have danced in open arms and Sarah currently dances with us in Truman. And there's just all these beautiful connections. So yay, and good information from everybody. So as Laura said, we are Open Arms Dance Project. Um, I am Megan Brandel, and I'm the founding artistic director. I have silver and gray hair and hazel eyes, and I am a white 44-year-old woman. I'm sitting in front of a teal wall with a little shelf with knickknacks and artwork. Hi, I'm Heather Marie, and I too am 44 years old. I am wearing a 
a gray with maroon sleeved open arms t-shirt and I have brown hair and brown eyes. I go by she, her pronouns and I have cerebral palsy. Oh, and I meant to say also, um, I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is hypermobility, which gets more intense as I age. And so it's a little bit of a hidden disability, although I, I am very conflicted about whether I identify as a person with a disability or not. In our presentation, I will um, use both people first and identity first language. Um, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A if you're interested. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. So here's a collage of what we do. Um, I will briefly describe kind of an overview of these pictures. So um, there's what I see are a lot of smiles and um, a lot of arms reaching and uh, many hugs happening, hands being held, uh, more smiles and, uh, and groups of beautifully diverse people. So Open Arms Dance Project is multi-generational and inclusive. So Heather, that means we take dancers as young as? Uh, seven years old is our youngest dancer. And our oldest dancer is 81 this year. Yeah. So we have a dancer born in every decade since the 1930s, which we're super proud of. And then we also um, have dancers with and without seen and unseen disabilities. And so you'll see in these pictures um, all of those. And I could have included so many more pictures. I prepared a whole slideshow for this, but um, we're actually going to put the slides away because the title of this is Centering People with Disabilities. And hey, we've got some people with disabilities here. And um, so we're just going to focus on us and um, what we're saying. And sometimes that's what I do in our art, too. Um, we've had some of our fanciest costumes this year, but I often just like to see us dressed in just black or something really simple so you can see the person um, and not get distracted by a lot of zhuzhing up um, of stuff, although that's fun. So uh, our mission is to create greater joy and compassion with dance that opens hearts, minds, and arms. And our vision is empowering a diversity of people to share their unique creative expression through equitable, collaborative dance making that has the ability to transform communities. And so those are pretty um, yummy, dense mission and vision. And we're gonna dig down into the philosophies and the values underneath those. And I really appreciate Sarah and Heather um, and all that you talked about, and this is gonna go nicely. So this is usually stuff that we only talk about with the dance company members and um, take it away. Heather's gonna first present four tips for just like basic respectful interaction. And these are overlap with some of the stuff you've already heard. Go for it. Hi, the number one uh, tip is to look a person with a disability in the eyes. If they're in a wheelchair, you want to kneel down next to them and get to eye level before you address them. Um, the second one is that you want to talk. You want to talk directly to the person with a disability, not just the person or people that they are with. Um, an example of that would be if Megan and myself entered your art class, you would ask me, um, Heather, do you have the supplies that you need? Is the chair that you're sitting in comfortable? Instead of asking Megan if Heather has the supplies she needs or is the chair she's sitting in a comfortable seat? Um, number three, you would always ask a person with a disability if they need help before offering them help. Um, I know from personal experience that whenever I've tripped or lost balance, um, someone's first reaction is to come up to me and try to pull me by the arm or lift me up in some way. And that can actually further injure me or it can knock me off whatever balance I happen to still have. So it's always important to ask. Um, number four is you want to talk in a respectful tone of voice to a person with a disability no baby talk. Unless you're addressing a small child, then it would be an acceptable tone of voice. But otherwise, yeah, try to talk to them in, in the age that suits them. And again, I've, I realize that people tend to think you have a disability. So they try to address you as if you're five or six. But I know myself, I'm 
again, 44. And so I like to be addressed in that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. And then I'm going to read our values. And there's seven of them. And they're really meaty. And um, I love these. They, um, there's a lot of information in there. And these could be like discussed for hours. Um, but just let them wash over you and, um, and notice what stands out to you and notice what it would be like if you made art based on, um, or if you kind of set these values and these expectations in your art space. And Heather is going to pick out her favorites. And uh, I, oh yeah, I did mention that Sarah dances with it. So Sarah, you could pick out your favorite too. Um, number one, everyone is welcome as they are with open arms. Number two, we treat each other as equals. We celebrate each other. We lift each other up with kindness. Number three, we reject a hierarchy of helpers and those who need help. We all need support sometimes. We all can offer support sometimes. There are no volunteers versus participants. We are all equal members contributing everything we can. Which one is your favorite among just those first three? I like number two because it says that we are all equal and we celebrate one another. And I like to be treated equally. So yeah. That's important. I mean, this these are good tips, not um, specific to disability, but just like all these tips, just um, anybody would appreciate being treated like these. Um, these specify. So number four then, oh, well, I'll share my favorite there. So the hierarchy and rejecting that is really important in open arms because um, we have different ages. We have some people who are retired school teachers and they're used to like getting a whole classroom of people and telling them what to do, but they're now part of our group and we're trying to share and, and, um, and operate in equal ways. And so Everybody brings in these real nuggets of, um, of knowledge and skills, and we all um, just treat those as if they all have equal value, not one greater than the other. Number four, when we walk through the studio doors, we are ready to work hard at the edge of where we are comfortable. We are ready to be present and let creativity guide us. <clears throat> Number five, everyone is giving of their best self. All of us have unique personalities, experiences, skills, and perspectives to contribute. Number six, we are here for reasons that are bigger than ourselves. We are here not only to be with friends and have fun dancing, but to also move culture forward by demonstrating radical acceptance and compassion in how we interact with each other. And number seven, we are committed to the Open Arms community, the mission, and the vision. Um, Sarah, do you want to turn to, I, I know there, you might not memorize them, but you can summarize which one's your favorite. Nope. Um, and I was going to, I hope I don't cry, but number six is my favorite. Um, because not only while I'm performing, it brings me to tears sometimes, but when I'm actually watching and observing in pieces that I'm not a participant in it at, at the moment, I re I look out at the audience or at the, even people passers by, um, and, you can feel and you can see how just our presence and and the things that we are doing how impactful it is on those observing and watching and who are in the audience at how how we treat each other and we treat each other in the community when when we're out 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 and about and um that to me just speaks so speaks volumes of of what our our what all seven of those um principles emulate um and it it really it chokes me up every time I can't I honestly can't look out at the audience because everyone's bawling their eyes out and then it makes me cry so um it really just shares um shows visually invisibly how people are so impacted by by what what this program does and how how effective the arts are in our community in our society wow thank you Sarah <laughs> <laughs> and just a reminder that one is, um, we are here for reasons bigger than ourselves. And just a note, like Sarah mentioned that people often cry at our performances and I'm still trying to figure out why um, they're pretty joyful. We're going to show you a short clip because after all, we're a dance company. We're not, you know, talking is the thing we never do. We always just move and move to music. Um, 
and the piece we'll show you is one of the more serious pieces um but we have lots like heather and i just did the chicken dance with some kids at, at the anne frank memorial to celebrate anne frank's birthday so joy and compassion are built into our mission um but i think the crying um i mean also built into our mission is we're opening hearts just to see a diversity of people and to see each like we have true friendships in the group and um that's just a beautiful thing so you need to do your favorite of those last three oh. do you remember them oh yes well my like sarah's is also number six yeah. um because i too like to see our, how we are able to um express our joy and our love of through our pieces that we've created to the audience and those around us. I just think that's really special to see. Yeah. Um, and I really like the one that we're giving of our best selves. So that means if somebody can leap and um, spin and do fouette turns that they can go for it and do that. And everybody else has something else of value that they um, contribute. And then we go back to that one that we dismantle that hierarchy leaping and spinning is no better than smiling and um, opening your arms and hugging somebody when they come in. They're, they're both equally valuable in our group and they should be in the world. But like that last one says, we're trying to change culture. So that's what we're doing there. So um, those are our values. That's how we make the art we make. Um, we're going to now watch a little clip um, Oh, this was wonderful. We got to perform at the Morrison Center for the Performing Arts last year. Idaho Public Television was there. They made two pieces. This one is called Strength, and that was the name of the piece of choreography choreographed by myself and the 22-23 dance company of Open Arms Dancers. Sarah and Truman helped choreograph it in the beginning, and then they had to take a break for the season, so you won't see them in this end of season performance. Um, but what's beautiful about this is we collaborated with a disabled composer and right there I'm using identity first language very intentionally. Um, Molly Joyce and she came to Boise and interviewed our dancers and then she incorporated their actual voices into the soundtrack. She um, captioned them so that whole section is done by Molly Joyce and then we choreographed a dance to it. Uh, also way behind the scenes. Uh, because the Morrison Center is also awesome and has this the crew and the capabilities to do this, there was somebody doing an audio description in the uh, audio visual booth and it was being piped through to headphones to a woman who was blind in the audience and so she was experiencing a live performance live description and i'm so proud of that that's the first time that's been done in Boise that I know of. Um, so all that accessibility and then of course what we're doing on stage and i didn't even go into like the actual dance techniques um, we use to create inclusive dance but you'll see a little snippet of them so enjoy what is strength for you How do you know you're strong when you can ride horses? Yes. When you can go on hikes? Hikes. When you can keep up with people, that shows you're strong? <laughs> and when you can dance? When you dance for people, that shows them that you're strong? I think. Trick that ability to make people feel so welcome is a real strength and everybody chips in and is hugging and clapping and smiling and patting each other on the backs like that creates our feeling of community and that's a huge strength. Passion and Caring for people. Physically, I don't tend to have a lot of actual physical strength, but I have a lot of strength in terms of what I can tolerate that a lot of people won't, can't, won't 
do with like like because I have because my muscles hurt all the time so I don't know what's like not to live in pain strength for me comes from within but as far as um, how I gain it I'll gain strength through the situation at hand like dance I gain a lot of strength by the movements that we create because with my disability I never thought I could dance it was never something I ever considered until I found open arms Yay, both Heather and I were leaning to try to pull the yellow fabric because <laughs> we remember how how much we had to pull there. Um, so I forgot to mention that Idaho Public De Television did a more uh, more of a little documentary and that one's called Flipping the Script and that one just won a regional Emmy. So you need to go to IPTV and check those out. Woo! Um, but thank you so much for listening. I think it's time for Q&A now. Thank you so much, Heather and Megan. What a, a moving experience to hear you share, you know, your tips for respectful interaction, the values underpinning your dance project, and then to share a little bit of your actual dance with us. It's such a pleasure. Um, while maybe we have just a couple minutes for questions, I, I noticed every presenter today talking about community and talking about art making for having you know value in itself but also being in service of something larger than the self being in service of building community um i know celia with art spark talked about art making being an opportunity to sort of expand perceptions about how each individual can contribute um and idaho parents unlimited talked about you know in this like after covid moment where some folks are still pretty vulnerable. Art making can be a vehicle for calling us back to community. Um, and then, of course, Open Arms talks about, you know, I'm here for reasons bigger than myself as a foundational value. So I wondered if, you know, each presenter can just briefly speak about what you're excited for next um, for your communities that you serve. And I'll start with Celia. What's what's cooking? What are you getting ready to do? Well, it's taken a, a little while to um, really kind of find out and touch touch base with people. I don't know if everyone feels the same, but coming out of uh, COVID, we're not the same people that we were uh, when we went in. And so um, there's a lot of excitement within uh, the community in terms of really wanting um, to um express themselves and it, it be, you know just being uh, you know the time is now so we you know we're we're working on our third season for our podcast we're in the middle of season two of true tales and uh we've got some exciting uh interviews and true tales is stories by told by people with uh disabilities and then we interview them a little and so very excited about that. And you can get it wherever you listen to your podcast. It's everywhere. And I see my, and uh, so, so also um, uh, Silva's got a few things up her sleeve. Silva Laukinen, uh, we're doing a lot uh, around research in uh, dance education. And I'm right now in Kentucky describing the 18 performances at the community theater, the, their national conference. And so I'm going to be launching a series of uh, web webinars for audio describers, particularly around dance. So I'm excited about that. So a lot, a lot happening. And um, I was really impressed with uh, both my uh, fellow presenters and the, the, the um, information that you shared is so important and for people to hear and, and for everyone to know that you just need to start, you know, just start serving, you know, including people with disabilities and, uh, 
and it'll, you know, and every day it'll get easier. And all of a sudden you'll figure out, you know, you'll say to yourself, why wasn't I doing this before? It's just, it's just so natural. So thank you, Laura, for, for having me. Thanks, Celia. How about Idaho Parents Unlimited? What are you, what's next? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Celia, for saying that. And thank you, Megan and Heather. Um, we are, I think I can speak for Sarah, like so proud to be a part of this community with you guys and the contributions that you make. And thank you, Laura, for putting this together so that we can push it out there. I think that's the thing I'm most excited about is that in the time that I've been working with IPOL, we've really fostered and created some, some beautiful uh, programs, but really being able to start now pushing them out in a way that we haven't before and having more visibility and having more conversation, like taking it to a more public sphere where we can maybe have some public art projects, you know, in our work of art program, we interact with businesses and really pulling those businesses in to be like, let's talk about hiring people um, with disabilities. Let's talk about, you know, getting these artists who are so talented, you know, out into the public sector where they can be hired. You know, a lot of times they need that little push or that resource to list, um, you know, these are people for hire. They can do graphic design. They can do all, you know, choreography. They can do pottery. They have so many skills and talents that sometimes just aren't put out there the way that they need to be. Um, so I think that's what I'm really excited to really lean into next. Yeah, so. I think my, the thing that I would hit on is that um, just reaching, reaching more, um, more kids, more youth, more individuals, more, anyone of all ages um, with a disability or not that um, sharing sharing our our love and joy of, of the arts um, and using it as a positive and creative outlet in whichever way that we choose to deal with some of the things that we're seeing in our in our in our intimate communities within our our more larger and global societal issues that that these are some things that can create healing um, mm -hmm. and that more sense of community and structure um, in a way that is is inclusive for all and encourage encourage us to use some of these um, systems as outlets um, right. instead of those that that aren't so helpful and um, so needed in right. this moment so needed right. thank you both um, how about open arms what are you most excited for next? I'll let Heather go for it. <laughs> Hi, I'm most excited for to be able to um, hopefully mentor other ambassadors that will be coming forward in the future and just helping them to be able to navigate public speaking a little bit easier uh, for them so that they'll be able to do programs such as this and others that are offered with ease and comfort. So I'm excited and looking forward to that future. Yeah, and we've had some really big things happen, Morrison Center and Idaho Public Television, and I, I feel like kind of pulling in and going deeper now, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> Thank you both. And I saw, Celia, you answered that question about the accessibility coordinator, so I will make sure to follow up with Clarissa about, you know, resources for that. Um, we're at time. I want to thank everybody for giving uh, your hour, especially thank you to our presenters who shared all of your deep, important work. Um, I hope everyone watching could take something from what they heard and you know bring carry it forward into your art teaching. Uh, we'll meet again for this webinar series uh, on June 29th. This one is a little maybe less exciting, but probably super relevant for people on the call, which is if you have a grant through Arts Idaho, uh, myself and then my colleague Allison Espindola will just take you through what that final reporting process looks like. Um, we call it demystifying final reports. It's hopefully everybody's favorite part of working in the arts, which is grant request and reporting can be a little bit easier. Um, and then I also wanted to encourage you, if you're an organization or an individual artist, to consider coming in for a grant. Um, we have quarterly grants that come up every three months. Um, they're not a bunch of money, but they can help you get a project done up to $1,100 of funding. And the next deadline is September 4th. So until then, um, sincere thanks to all of our presenters. And I hope we'll see you again at Arts Learning Lab. Bye.